Our message this morning comes from Mark chapter 2, verse 23 through 28. If you're using one of the Pew Bibles from the rack in front of you, that will be on page 992. Mark chapter 2, verse 23 through 28. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him? And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. This is God's holy oh, word. Man. <clears throat> I don't like wearing coats when I'm up here, but I, especially this one, somewhere there's a chilly horse. That's all I can say. <laughs> we have much uh, to be thankful for. This Wednesday at 7, we have our service, our Thanksgiving service, and um, remember that. Pray that God would encourage our hearts. It's a delightful time to serve Him. I don't think I'd want to live in any other era. This is more challenge than anything else, and it's great, a good challenge. Um, the <clears throat> Also, we want to remember uh, our brothers and sisters in the persecuted church throughout the week. Remember that as we give thanks to God for the privilege of prayer. Um, take a look at the um, bulletin board out on the <clears throat> facing north and check out some of the countries and maybe this week hold them up in prayer. Remember to pray for northern Nigeria, Reverend Alta, and hold our brothers and sisters up before the throne of grace. We, um, <clears throat> today during Sunday school, our time of education in the chapel, we'll be having a, a look at Nehemiah, particularly on the ingredients of revival in the prayer of uh, portion of 8, 9, and a little bit of 10. So we're going to look at this, these, uh, these passages in Nehemiah. Very, very powerful. Um, <clears throat> we'll keep ourselves uh, focused on the things of Christ by the grace of God. Now today we're looking at, <clears throat> oh, and I want, to re, I want to bring up two, two more people. Remember to pray for Judy and, um, and Chuck as they recover from their hip replacements, um, both doing really well. The, the uh, opportunities to have such surgeries are a real blessing. Just some things. Look at the text, Mark 2, 23 through 28. This, this is a, a text that focuses thematically upon the Sabbath. Now, in the modern era, uh, since the resurrection, we refer to this as the first day of the week. Uh, this, this is the first day of the week, our Sabbath, Sunday. The resurrection made it so. <clears throat> so when we think of Sabbath, think of corporate worship on Sunday. So when we, <clears throat> this is focused on the, on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath. And in Jesus' time, of course, it would be, <clears throat> we would call uh, the last day of the week. And now the first, but the Sabbath was a day and, a, and an opportunity to serve God and its keeping was far more important than the issue of fasting. And so we wanna keep that in mind. Fasting was important, but not as important as the celebration of the Sabbath. What Jesus and his disciples were doing, going around and plucking grains of corn was legal 
Deuteronomy 23, 25, the law allows for that. But the Pharisees, what they noted was according to their 39 forbidden acts on the Sabbath, that Jesus and his disciples were out of bounds. So what you're seeing in the text here, what they were doing, the actual eating, was permissible. But what the Pharisees were upset about was the, um, the breaking of one of the 39 acts forbidden on the Sabbath. So they were ticked at Jesus and his disciples. In addition, you'll notice that Jesus says <clears throat> in verse 26, uh, how he entered the house of God, that being David, in the time of Abiathar, the high priest. Some textual critics say that <clears throat> the passage referred to is 1 Samuel <clears throat> chapter 21, <clears throat> and um, in this passage you see Ahimelech is referred to as the high priest. Well, the problem goes away when we realize that in the Old Testament, Ahimelech and Abiathar are often in interchanged, and it would appear that that was another name for Ahimelech, and then of course his son followed him. Others argue that they overlapped in their, in their priesthood. So we see in the text here Sabbath is on display, the breaking of the Sabbath. This is not something uh, to be taken lightly, but we must recognize some of the things that keep the Sabbath holy, and we're going to look at those today, that keep it what it should be. So let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, who is the Son of Man, even Lord of the Sabbath, he is the King of Kings, he is indeed the one who makes the rules, for he is the Creator. Lord, on this day, would you take away the, the uh, cobwebs of our lives, take away the the our thoughts that are spinning right now because of our busy world. And Lord, let us concentrate by the Holy Spirit on the Word of God, and may it change our hearts. We ask these things in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, I noticed in the, <clears throat> in the leaflet sent to me, Walk Humbly with Your God, True Spirituality in the Age of Counterfeit, that Dr. Zach Eswine is, is uh, speaking on the whole issue of busyness. One of his lectures will be on um, worship of God in the midst of a busy uh, world. And uh, having sat under his teaching, thankfully, at Covenant Seminary, I think he's going to be driving at this event by event living that we have in our, in our, li in our lives. We are extremely busy. Those who watch the West, who watch us uh, say, those who within the Western sphere also who examine living, say that we are moving from one event to another. We're hooked on activity. We must go bang, 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 bang in sequence. Now that's not, and then sometimes that's necessary, but then there are times when it is not. It would appear that we are addicted to activity in order to make ourselves feel better. It is when we include corporate worship in this string of events that things get uh, problematic. When we live in a world, a busy world of one event after another, and we place corporate worship in this, in this string, things begin to come apart. We tend to become irritable and demanding, and we want other people to make us happy, but can't be. So a busy world, although sometimes it can't be helped and is not ungodly, very often <clears throat> it is just that, not glorifying to God. So in the busy world, we, <clears throat> when we come to worship, we tend to be spinning in mind and life. How then, this is our question for today, how then shall we live in the midst of a busy world? 
in a midst where we move from one event to another and we think very often we think it's just good for us as long as I get all these events done then I'll feel fine our focus today is what does it take to keep the Sabbath to the glory of God what does it take to keep the Sabbath or the corporate worship time on Sunday, what does it take to keep the Sabbath to the glory of God? What does it take? In the text here before us, we see the main theme is Sabbath keeping. We see that around this, we, we see certain truths collected and we want to, we want to um, bring those out. When we live in a world like this that is so busy, we move from one event to the other and we think, whoa, I just have 10 more today and then I can relax. And really that doesn't quite happen if we are honest with ourselves. And when we include corporate worship in the string, our world begins to crumble. So what does it take to keep the Sabbath? What does it take to keep our lives together to the glory of God? It takes three things, a heart, a desire, and a passion. All related words. It takes a heart, a desire, and a passion. Let's begin with verses 23 through 26, and we'll explain as we go. What we're gonna do is present the meaning and then apply the meaning to our hearts. Here it is. What does it take to keep the Sabbath? What does it take to keep our lives together? What does it take to keep corporate worship out of a string of events? 23. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples, that is the disciples of Jesus, began to pluck the heads of grain. So they were doing what the law permitted, wandering through their neighbor's uh, fields, taking some heads of grain and consuming them. And the Pharisees were saying to him, so they showed up on the scene, kind of the legal police. And they showed up, look, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? What, why are you doing? what is not lawful on the Sabbath. Now again to them, lawful was this. Jesus and his disciples were breaking one of the 39 rules for the Sabbath established by the Pharisees. According to the law in Deuteronomy, it was fine. What the Pharisees did was they said, well, if you, even if you did this grain thing on the Sabbath, you were you're breaking the Sabbath because that's harvesting. It's harvesting. And uh, you just can't do that. So you're bad and stop it. And Jesus and he, Jesus said to them, have you never read? Very critical passage. What David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him. Verse 26, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat and also gave it to those who were with him. Stop there. The, what does it take to keep the Sabbath? What does it take to keep corporate worship from being added to a list of, of events? What, so that we arrive harried and we leave harried. What does it take to, to keep the Sabbath to the glory of God? It takes a heart for God's word. A heart for God's word. Look at this. Look at what Jesus says. Have you never read? And he continues the verse. What a challenge. Underline that. 
Have you never read? Let's go back to the text, 1 Samuel 21. 1 Samuel 21. Now, <clears throat> this is a passage that they, these are folks who are making rules uh, for, the, for the people. And, uh, you know, they're, they're in a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> they're in a position of authority. But what Jesus is saying, have you never read? You ought to know this, he's saying. 21 verse 1 of 1 Samuel. Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech came to David trembling and said to him, Why are you alone and no one is with you? And David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has charged me with a matter and said to me, Let no one know anything of the matter but which I send you and with which I have charged you. This is during the days when David is fleeing from tyranny. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of the bread of whatever is here. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is only holy bread. This is the show bread. But there is only, there is holy bread. If the young men have kept themselves from women, and David answered the priest, truly women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy even when it is an ordinary journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no, for there was no bread but the bread of the presence, which is removed from the, before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. This is the passage to which Jesus is referring. Notice, and again, Ahimelech, was also referred to as Abiathar <clears throat> in other parts of the Old Testament. You see this interchanging. But also, the best explanation for Abiathar not being named there is either because his term overlapped with Ahimelech or it's another name for Ahimelech. I take that explanation. So this is the passage, and Jesus said, Have you not read... This is David we're talking about here. We're not talking about uh, some schlock. We're talking about David. He's saying to the Pharisees, go back to Mark. He says, how when he was hungry, and those were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence. Jesus points them to the text. Real need, real human need, the real need of the people of God outweighs the issue of ritual. So real human need always outweighs the need to maintain ritual. The ritual isn't bad. The ritual is good. But human need, especially the need of the people of God, outweighs it. And Jesus is saying, now you're the interpreters of the text, how come you didn't see this? How come? How many other wonders did they miss? And Jesus will point them out as we walk through the book of Mark. <clears throat> A heart for God's word overturns texts and looks for meaning and is encountered by the wonderful truths that set us free. Here's one of them. A heart for God's word. Consider this. How many other wonders are missed, not only by the Pharisees, but by the people of God today, by us? Because we refuse to take the time to study the word and to apply the word to our lives. Think about these truths which should encourage proper and God-honoring worship. Let's just take a look at the book of Mark so far. What truths have we learned about God, about Jesus, that should drive us to worship him more and more? The first one we've learned from today's text is that God is compassionate. Real need exceeds ritual. You see, he... He, God, wants his people to be joyful. He wants his people to delight in him. He wants his people to have their needs met. 
So real need exceeds ritual. That's a wonderful truth. And when we come to worship, we can say, God, you're compassionate. You want us to live a life of honor before you and you desire to meet our needs. That is a critical truth. What? How amazing is our God, how compassionate he is. Now, other truths that can drive us to the text, to, to time of worship and delight. In uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, we read, <clears throat> The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in, in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Amazing verse that God, this is the mission of God, to drive his son into the wilderness for our sakes. And he was tempted by the devil. Look at his love for his people. Also, just before that, in verses 9 through 11, we encounter the Holy Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father speaking, the Holy Spirit descending in a most amazing way upon the Son of God. Wow! Compassion. We see God sending his own son into the wilderness and ultimately to the cross for, for our eternal need. We also see here in chapter 2 and verse 5 how Jesus is divine and that he forgives sins. In chapter 2 verse 14, the sovereign call of Christ in chapter 2, verse 27, the sovereign grace of Christ. All of these things, these verses, just when we study them and apply them and think about them, they lead us to deeper truths about God, and we must come and worship Him corporately. All of life is worship, I realize that, but we must come and worship God on the Shabbat, on the Sabbath, on Sunday, on this first day of the week where we remember the resurrection of Jesus. And there is another point. When we come to it in the book of Mark, you will see the wonder of the resurrection. So a heart for God's word. What does it take to keep the Sabbath to the glory of God? What does it take to enliven corporate Sunday, Sunday morning corporate worship and all of life? What does it take? A heart for God's word, for the truth of God, when that truth hits us, it dislodges worldliness and makes us think of the greatness of God and our own need. The Pharisees weren't doing that. They were not studying. They were not thinking. They weren't praying the word. They were making their own rules, 39 rules for the, for the Sabbath. Had they been students of the word, they would not have been confronted as such. Have you never read? Oh God, help me, a sinner. The busyness of my world takes me away from the study of the Word of God. And when we study the Word and apply it by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're driven to God. Here's a question before we go to our application time. Does our study of the word bring us to God with awe? Does our study of the word bring us to God with awe? It should. And I am, the, am a sinner and I do not often, as I should, dig in to the precious word of God. Too busy, I say to myself. But when I do get into the scriptures, I realize, as you do, oh, I've missed so much. Breathe on me, breath of God. Does our study of the word bring us to God with awe? What does it take to keep the Sabbath to the glory of God? Heart for the word. There's another. A desire for rest, body and soul. A desire for rest. Look at verse 27. And he said to them, Jesus continues to bombard the Pharisees with truth. Now he hits them with the next one. The Sabbath, the Shabbat, the Sabbath, or Sunday today, was made, key word made, for man, not man for the Sabbath. The key word is made. It's a creative word. A desire for rest is what it takes. 
But let us examine what is happening here. The Sabbath was made, in a human sense, <clears throat> an intolerable burden by the Pharisees. Yet it was meant to be a gracious gift. We're not supposed to be enslaved to the concept. The concept of, 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 of worship a day, a corporate day of worship, uh, was a merciful provision for the people of God. We need spiritual and physical encouragement, and that is good. Jesus, our creator, and, and I want to... <clears throat> We're going to point this out in a moment under the issue of passion, but I just want to allude to it. It's a creative, the Sabbath day is a creative act. And it was brought about by God the Son to give us rest, both spiritually and physically. Now, all of life is worship, I know that, and there is a lot of activity, and it can be legitimately busy, but often we create busyness so that we just feel better about ourselves. It's called self atonement. Look what I did, look what I do, look at all this stuff. Oh yeah, big deal. What about rest for body and soul? This is a gracious provision of God for his people. Do we view the Sabbath as a day of rest for our bodies and souls? Do we see as we sing, as we pray, as we delight in God, do we relax in the Holy Spirit? Oh, Holy Spirit, speak to my heart. Speak to me, O oh Lord. May my body, may my soul find rest in you, O oh God, and you alone. Or am I thinking about the next event for the rest of the day? Or, oh, well, look at this. I don't like this much. Wait a minute. What's that? It's worldliness. Rest, relaxing, trusting in God, a desire for him, a desire for true rest, Sabbath rest. We must move to the next point. So therefore, on Sunday evenings, can we truly say that we have rested and are prepared for the week to come? This is critical. The Sabbath was made, was not we were not made for the Sabbath. We're not made to just be its slave or a burden. Sabbath was made for us, a divine provision for our bodies and souls to actually rest and be prepared for what else is coming in the next week. That's the provision of God. Is he not merciful? What we have done, unfortunately, is we have, as the Pharisees have done, we've added our own 39 acts for the Sabbath. Well, we can do this, we can do that. Um, <clears throat> can't do this, uh, can't do that, but we can do all this other stuff. Um, on Sunday evenings, can we truly say that we've rested and prepared for the week to come? The third one is a passion for lordship. We have a heart for God's word. We have a desire for rest, body and soul. And now we have a passion for lordship. That is the lordship of Christ. Now I want to camp on this for a moment. Verse 28, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Since Jesus made everything and set aside the Sabbath, it is his to rule. Now note these verses, Hebrews chapter 1. In Hebrews chapter 1, we want to see this again. We've talked about it before and we preached through Hebrews. We want to do it again. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Christ is the agent of creation. The father, working through the son, created all things that we see. He, through whom also he created the world. Now we go back to Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. This wonderful truth regarding Christ must be understood. 
We are creationists, yes, but we also recognize that because he is creator, he is Lord over it. Chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. God set aside the day. Jesus set aside the day. Jesus is therefore Lord of the Sabbath. He made it. He rules it. He makes the rules. He healed people. Mark 1.25 and Mark 1.31. Remember those. He healed people on the Sabbath. Implying what? He made it all. He does as he pleases. He makes the rules. He is Lord. John chapter 5 verse 17. John 5 verse 17. I want to show you a very important verse in all of this. This is regarding the healing at the pool on the Sabbath. <clears throat> the um, verse 9 of John 5, and at once the man was healed, he took up his bed and walked. Jesus said, get up, take up your bed and walk. And so he did, and he did this on the Sabbath, and he incurred uh, the opposition. Jesus said, <clears throat> verse 16, in this way, why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But, 17, Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. This is creative language. God is at work, and so am I. This is the language of Jesus as creator. This is the language of Jesus as healer, as the one who brings glorious things to his people. He's the one at work, the Father is at work, and they are, they are in union, and he acts according to the bidding of the Father. And this act, these actions that he takes on the Sabbath clearly declare, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Christ is our Lord. Sunday is his day for us. Now, here's what we say about this. It is an act of submission to Christ as Lord when we come to corporate worship on Sunday. We recognize his lordship when we come to worship on Sunday. We give honor to the Lord when we come. Now, this is where <clears throat> we live in a culture that is really good at distraction. It's very good. The enemy is at work, not only politically, but within the church to create distractions. I understand that busyness can happen in life and it doesn't necessarily have to be ungodly, but there are times, if we were really honest, when our busyness is really for us. We want to self-atone. Look at how good I am by my busyness. I know, I'm just telling you what goes on in my own heart. So what does it take to keep the Sabbath when all of this is going on, all this noise in the background? What does it take? It takes a heart for God's word. It takes a desire for rest. We really do. We come, uh, we, 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 we word, and the word drives us to, to worship. When we come to holy worship, we recognize, God, I'm just... Throughout the week, I've been beaten up. Give me rest of soul and body. Teach me how to relax in you. May your atonement be sufficient for me. And then there is the passion for lordship in verse 28. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. This is the high point of the whole passage. Don't miss this. He is Lord. By virtue of his creative genius, because God in Christ created all things that you see, because of that, we come on Sunday, I'm not eliminating the other times of worship you have, but when he comes, when we come on Sunday, when we come to the corporate day of worship, we come and declare, whenever we bow our heads, whenever we 
read the word and sing to his honor and glory, we're saying, you, Jesus, are Lord. You made this day. I am recognizing and submitting to your lordship whenever I come to worship. So it is an opportunity to honor Jesus' lordship. The distractions in our culture are these. I'll come if you entertain me. I'll come if you give me bread and circus. I'll come as long as I'm tickled. But what I understand some of the motivations behind altering worship to turn it into what might be called an evangelistic event or to turn it into an, uh, an event that just fits into the world. You show up and there's dust all over the place. It's in the air, activity, limbs flinging in all directions and bodies moving and lots of perspiration. Well, it just isn't, sorry. We come to honor Christ and his lordship, King of kings and Lord of lords. Do we see Sunday worship as an opportunity to honor Jesus as Lord? Or do we seek entertainment as one would from the many events in our world? If we think of worship, corporate worship on the Shabbat, on Sabbath, on Sunday, day of resurrection, shifted one day because of that, um, if we come, if Sunday's just another event, then we don't get it. Because the Lord is present through the Holy Spirit, and he is observing from the right hand of the Father, honor me, he is saying, in essence. Honor my Lordship through your worship. Honor me, he says. So what does it take to keep the Sabbath to the glory of God. It takes a heart for the word, a desire for rest, and a passion for lordship. The desire for rest fits in between. It links the two of them. If you read the word, study it, and it fills your soul, what do you begin to see? The need for rest, Sabbath rest. Lord, I just wanna calm down. I want to hear your voice. I want to be present with you and quiet. And then it ties to lordship. It's in the moment of rest that we can say, God, your son is the Messiah. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, honoring his lordship. That's what it takes and other things too. This is not exhaustive. What does it take to keep the Sabbath to the glory of God? Here are some of the lessons that come forth from this, and then we'll close. Number one, are we ready to, are we a people who are ready to delight in the study and application of God's word? We may do this as individuals, we may do it in a group. Are we a people who delight in the study and application of God's word? The daily bread is a fine little tool, but it's no substitute for the word of God. Digging into scripture, digging in, and studying and wrestling with texts, and having the texts wrestle with us. And if a joint is pulled out because we're wrestling, so be it. But there must be a struggle. Seek to walk in a deeper manner through the study of God's word linking the doctrines of truth that we find as we go and how they impact our world. This is study. When we engage the scriptures, we must engage them with a great desire to know God. We do have opportunities. We can make more. Bible studies, yep. Just ask, I have a passion. I wanna study. Wednesday evening, Thursday morning, 6.30. One is p.m., the other one's a.m. I didn't think there were two when I was in university. 6.30 p.m. exists, but is there one in the morning? I don't know. 
but there are. Wednesday night, Thursday morning, and any other morning, if it works out, we'll get a team and we'll pray and we'll word. May there be a revival in the study of the Word of God. When we deal with Nehemiah today, you'll see that. It comes up as one of the elements of revival, by the way, is this critical issue of the study of the Word of God. And if you have a good book on the study of revival, you'll see that this keeps coming up in the history of the church. The Word of God, the Word of God, studied and applied, wrestled, uh, with which we wrestle and we struggle and we strive to know God. That's one of them. So, are we a people who delight in the study and application of God's word? There, this must be. The second thing, while it's important to reject unnecessary restrictions on the Sabbath, those things that uh, enslave us, it is also important to avoid indulging in corruptions which deny God's intention and merely tickle our pleasures. So many things that we can do on the Sabbath that deny God's, God's will for us. Some of them can be very dark. Examine our lives in prayer and observe where we're too loose or too tight. Particularly too loose. By the Spirit, make our lives right, O Lord, before our Lord Jesus Christ. Make our lives right. I know that there are those who, in our culture, in the evangelical culture, there used to be, who would spend their time watching others and seeing if they're breaking their rules. <laughs> not talking about that, you know, that, that's nonsense. We want to see in our own lives, by the study of the Word of God, where we are too lax and where we're too tight. God teaches the balance. And let us reject indulging in corruptions which deny God's intentions and tickle our pleasures. We know what they are. Just ask the person of the Spirit to search our hearts. Thirdly, maybe over the next four or five Sunday evenings, let's make some notes. Just sit down and make a note. Put it on the calendar. On this particular Sunday evening, did I really rest on this day? Did the pattern of rush, 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 and event, 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 was it broken? Did this pattern suddenly come to a halt and did I truly rest? So for the next maybe four or five Sundays, let's see what we do. I want to do it. Think about it. Did I really rest? Did I come seeking to uh, honor the Lordship of Christ? Did, did I come with a heart full of word and... After a week of struggle with the Word of God in the midst of all the hurriedness? And lastly, know that the day of the Lord is meaningless without Christ, who is the Lord of all. If the day of the Lord does not touch a person in any way, then something is wrong, and it could be egregious unbelief that leads to hell. And if God is showing one of us today that this is truly the attitude of one's heart, then repent and trust in Jesus Christ. What does repentance mean? It means to turn away from a life of sin, a life of pleasure, self-seeking, a life of self-enjoyment. Put your trust or your faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross rose from the dead, ascended, and is coming again. That Jesus. The one who said that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. That one. The King of kings and Lord of lords. The one for whom, now we are here, and it's for his honor that we're here. It's one of the things, we're not just here because it's a thing to do. We're here to honor Christ's lordship. You're Lord of the Sabbath. So... Trusting in Christ brings you into such a relationship where you desire to honor Jesus. May the Spirit of God so move to bring about repentance, confession, to bring about true faith so that you may live and honor Jesus all the days of your living. As a sinner, I want to ask God today, help me to know the difference between rush, 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 event, 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 and never to put worship in that list. May corporate worship be a place where I go, where I keep. How does this 
stay with me. I, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, help me to have a heart for the word, a desire for rest, and a passion for the Lordship of Christ. Then we shall grow, and then we shall delight in the great things. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, who is creator, who is sustainer, he prays for us from the right hand of the Father. He intercedes for us as the people of God. He does for us things that we simply cannot do for ourselves. Jesus is the Son of Man. He's the Son of God. He is the one who is Lord of the Sabbath. He is the one to whom we come. And in order to keep the Sabbath, Lord, in order to keep it and to honor you, Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit on this day, would you make us people of the Word? Let's have a heart for the Word, O oh Lord. Give us a desire for rest, rest for body and soul, so that we can truly hear your voice. There's nothing else spinning in our minds. And Lord, by the Holy Spirit, would you give us a, a great passion for the Lordship of Christ. This is the day upon which we come, in which we come and declare that he is Lord and give him the honor he deserves.